No, I don't think so. I would say, because, like, a saying, I would say, is, like, a ring doesn't guarantee anything. Like, you know, like, um, also because, like, people can remarry and stuff. So I just feel like just because you're married to someone, it doesn't gar guarantee that you're going to be together forever. I think money. Money definitely is that. And then, like, with money, you come to, like, other problems, like less communication and all that. I believe that they should. That way maybe it'll teach them to not do certain things that maybe their parents didn't do right and maybe it'll sh show them an example of what they should and should not do. I think yes, but to a certain point. That's what I believe. Because I shared my some experiences, but to a certain point. Because I'm afraid that that my child would say, well, mom, you did it, so why can't I? So I think to a certain point. <laughs> I think there's a big mix of that. I think that in today's world, we have a problem with helicopter parents where they hold on so tight where they don't let them go, build their own personalities, find their own interests or explore appropriately. And I think that causes a lot of problems. But I think there are also parents who don't care enough about what their child is doing where they're not aware of their own interests, that they're not actually parenting them, but maybe being more of a friend. And I think there's a lot of danger in that. I think married. I, I love growing um, our relationship. I love growing together. I think that's so, so fun, just watching another person and having another person to lean on. Marriage does have a good way of exposing your flaws, though. <laughs> yeah, the things you yeah. missed in the single <laughs> stage. Yeah. Uh, he, he loves marriage, you know? Um, if, if he didn't, then I, I wouldn't. Hey, um, okay, so we're going to do something a little different today. Uh, we are wrapping up a series we've been in. If you've been with us, uh, all about marriage, about dating, about singleness, about parenting, um, all these different topics we've discussed over the last like four weeks. And today we wrap that conversation up uh, and I decided, you know what, what better than to have my wife Jenny here um, to join me. Uh, yeah. Good morning. So, um, so when I talk about how women should act She'll be here so she can fix it. All right. Um, I'm just joking. If you don't know me, I, that was a joke. Uh, I don't always make good jokes, but I attempt to. All right. Hey, so we're going to dive in. It's going to be a little different today, um, but I want to encourage you. We're going to wrap up this series, and then next week, man, please, uh, if you have a Bible, bring your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I would love to give you a Bible, um, and we are going to go through the book of Jude. It's uh, one of the last books in the New Testament. And we're going verse by verse through this text, and we're going to see what God has to say. Uh, it's speaking to a broken church, uh, speaking to a broken people, a broken society, uh, all this kind of stuff. And I think that is very relevant for all of us today. So next week, diving into Jude, but this week, wrapping up this conversation, and we've been talking about all these different topics. Uh, and really, the goal is uh, to really kind of come to like, what does God say about these things? Because uh, at the end of the day, relationships uh, are everything to all of us. Uh, the most joy that you have, the greatest memories in your life usually come from a relationship. The greatest pains and the, the biggest scars and wounds that you carry often come from a relationship. It's the ones we love. It's the ones we do life with. So we want to talk a little about that. And uh, first, we can maybe introduce ourselves slightly. Uh, you've seen me, but not often do you see my wife. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I usually stay behind, behind the scenes. <laughs> she does not like being up here. So um, I only get it maybe once a year, and, uh, and it's tough. So It's okay. God's working in me, guys. Um, so we've been married for 13 years, and we have uh, four, ch four kids. One is an adult who's married to our beautiful daughter-in-law, and they're sitting up there. <laughs> putting them in the spot. Um, and it's been 
it's been definitely um, a blessing. Like God has blessed us in so many ways, and there's been so many challenges. But we're gonna share. We're gonna share a little bit of, of that um, in a little bit. But that's us. Yeah. So um, we uh, we've lived in California where we met. We uh, lived in Florida for five years, kind of on our own. We had no family out there. Um, we come from a blended family. Uh, and we have seen God work mightily, um, and it's been amazing to see how God can use a blended family, and we've even had sermons on that before where we see throughout Scripture God takes blended families and He uses them in great ways. Um, so we've seen the blessing of that, uh, but we know that comes with different tensions or difficulties as well. Uh, we, uh, we have been blessed in marriage, but just like you, if you are married, you know it is not always easy, and there are some times where it's difficult. Uh, so we're going to share, but here's the truth. Um, it, we're not going to share because we have all the answers because we did it all right. We're going to share that, man, God seems to use all of us no matter how much we've messed things up uh, when we submit and come under his kind of call and authority in our life. So, all right, we're going to talk. And over the, over the weeks, we've talked about different topics. Uh, we've talked about singleness. Paul is very clear in his letter, and he, he says it very clearly also. He's like, this is not a command of the law like from God. This is my own recommendation. He's like, it's better to be single than to be married. That's his call. That's his recommendation. Uh, for some of us, maybe we're living a life right now where we're single and we're not always satisfied that. We don't like that. We don't want that. And what does Paul mean by that? And Paul clearly is getting to a point where it's also this realization of how much you can do for the gospel, but also uh, what God is doing in you when you are single. Uh, when you do not have responsibilities, uh, uh, that would be in addition to now you need to uh, protect, provide, satisfy a spouse. So Paul says this, and for some of us we hear it, but we don't really want to uh, understand the why behind that. And I think there's some value even in that. Um, Jenny and I, we met not in the church. Uh, we met at the workplace. Um, I saw her as we were working a job over the summer, and I, I was good, so I waited till the job uh, where she went back to the school, and I stayed where we were, uh, and then I was like, now I'm going to shoot my shot, and I did. Uh, I did it on social media, and I can still go back to that message, and it was pretty pathetic, but it worked. God, really? God, God works in mysterious ways. Um, but there was, there was something that we've talked about many times. She's shared with other people of uh, she was not uh, looking for a relationship at that time. Uh, she was really looking to even just kind of take care of yourself. Yeah, it was, um, it was a season in my life that I was just, um, I was done dating. <laughs> I was done trying to, and I know that a lot of women can relate to that, where we're feeling like the only way we can be loved is by finding someone, and sometimes we find it in the wrong place. And to what degree, to what price do we put ourselves in that situation where we we're hurt and we're and you know it's not a healthy environment that you get into these relationships that is just so toxic and I was done I was literally done with men at that point and then God brought him into my life and it's just you can I can go back and see how God God's hand was in that through the whole you know you know I don't know during that time too I remember talking to friends and saying you know they would tell me because um, when you're single, they always try to set you up, right? Like, if you're single, I don't know who can raise their hand and say, like... Nobody tried to set me up with nobody. <laughs> I mean, they're always trying to set you up on blind dates or, like, you should date my cousin and so-and-so and because -so, I feel like they feel sorry for you or whatever it is that they're trying to set you up with somebody. And that's not necessarily the, 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 the right way sometimes. It's, it's always God's timing. And we're so impatient that we always want to be in control that we try to take it into our own hands and control the situation. But it's like when you trust God that he has someone for you out there, he really, really does. And I remember hearing those words back then, and I was like, yeah, right. You know, that's not going to happen. But, but really when you do, I mean, that, during that time when him and I met, and he asked me out, um, I was working on my own relationship with God. And God was growing me, I gave my life to God, and I, I, had, um, I got baptized, and I was involved in church, and I was finally like, okay, I get it, God. Um, and, and then he brought Scott, and it was like, okay. Um, but it was healthy, it, everything happened organically, and, and it was like how 
people have said it before and I didn't believe it and it did. So it was it was definitely a blessing. When when we're uh I mean this singleness, dating, these things, it's really like a small glimpse into a problem that all of us have no matter where you're at in your stage of life. Uh, and it's that we try to force things and not trust God's timing. Uh, this happens in so many different areas where we're not willing to trust God and his plan for our life, so we try to take control of it. Now, even in that, God can use it, uh, and that's the amazingness of how God works, is even in our own selfish actions, we see it throughout Scripture. We just finished a series going through David, and David continues to sometimes take things into his own hands, and then he realizes what he did, and he goes back to God, and God still uses those things in the same way uh, when it comes to uh, this timing, it's trusting God and it's not forcing something, but saying maybe God has something in this season that I can grow in, learn from. Maybe God wants you to really know who you are in him before you begin to try to figure out who somebody else is that now you are committed to. Uh, but this goes into uh, dating as well and, and kind of the priorities that we have. Um, we've shared this briefly, but the scripture speaks about uh, don't be unequally yoked. Now, that's an old farming like um, illustration of two like ox that would have this wood beam across them, connecting them so that they would uh, plow the fields together in unity. Uh, and, and that, I mean, again, everything in their society was farming, uh, not in the same way for us, but in the same way as this, that you need to be on the same page, going in the same direction with the people that you're doing life with. And this isn't even just a uh, who you're going to marry. This is also a who you're surrounding yourself in community with, that these are the people that you, you become who you're like, right? You, you are what you eat or whatever, but you are in community with those people, and that's what you turn into over time. Guys at work all the time. This is we, we all have done it. We've all been in workplaces where it's just a bunch of dudes. And what do we do? We all turn into the same conversation, which is never good and is never appropriate. We wouldn't say this in front of others, but we do because we become that community that we're around in the same way. When it comes to who you're looking for in a spouse, uh, you need to be what is called equally yoked, uh, that you have these priorities in your life. Uh, things that I said is Christ, community, uh, and, and the church that these things need to be a staple in the person that you're looking for. If they do not recognize Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, your job is not to date them, to try to save them. That is not a great idea. Can it happen? Has God done it? Yes, but it also comes with a lot of heartache, and I've seen a lot of relationships that that doesn't, and marriages that, man, the, there's pain in that as they don't value the main thing the same way. But then church, do they, do, do they say, no, I'm a religious person, me and God are good, but like you never actually care about what Jesus says is his bride, the church, and that community of people that do life together. And then finally is the community that they surround. If you want to know what that guy's like, go hang out with him and his friends, and you'll quickly see uh, what they're like, he's likely like as well. And maybe you're like, maybe I don't like these people. Um, but anyway, okay, so this is in dating, but now we want to get to maybe what we want to spend a little more time on, and this is in marriage. Uh, I want to talk about a couple keys to uh, thriving in marriage, not just surviving. For many of us, we've kind of just got comfortable with where we're at. Maybe we're not fully comfortable, but it is what it is, and we're just existing in this stage, if you will. Uh, but I, I believe, man, Scripture is very clear. God says it over and over again. He wants us to experience a life that is thriving uh, in so many areas of our life, not just in our marriage, uh, but in your own like relationships, in your, in your own like career pursuit, in your own actions in life that you experience a life that is thriving. Um, and there's a couple areas that I think when it comes to relationships that are very important. One is what we call a, like serving love. There's, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but there's this thing called five love languages um, where everyone has a love language. And the whole illustration is like, we all have gas tanks and uh, you need to make sure your tank is filled, right? In the way of saying it, right? Um, and all of us have different ones. So my wife, uh, she is acts of service is one of them. So when I do something, like I change a light bulb, she's like, oh, he's amazing. Um, <laughs> maybe not that much, huh? But um, 
But mine is far more words of affirmation. Uh, I, I, I want to know, am I making a difference? Am I doing something good? What Sorry, is that's happening? My, that's my Apple Watch. Um, Siri's trying to jump in and <laughs> change. Okay. But then there's other ones. There's quality time. There's physical touch. And guys, that's not what you think it is. Um, that's like sitting and cuddling and watching a movie for three hours where you're uncomfortable. And you're like, I just would like to lounge out by myself. But um, what I want to say is like that a lot of times we think of these things like what is, what is our love language or something like that. That's not really what this is. When I say serving love, it's a picture in which uh, Christ shows us what this looks like. Um, Philippians where it says, uh, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. And what did Christ have? He came to serve, not be served. He, he came to care for others more than himself. And that this is what a serving love looks like. How do, we, how do we have a relationship where so many of us all the time we're looking at, will that person meet the needs or the wants that I have? But that's not what a relationship is. It's not, will you meet my needs as much as it's, how can I serve you and meet yours? And that alone is an important act for us to look at is how, how can we go into a relationship, into a marriage with a serving love to put the other before ourselves? And if I can plug in a little bit, because I mean, for me, Scott and I were raised completely different, right? Like Scott was raised in a Christian stable home. Uh, his parents were amazing. And um, they were the perfect example of what a marriage, like what a marriage, what a, a healthy home, Christian home, devoted home is, should be like. Um, whereas for me, I grew up in a very unstable, dysfunctional environment and uh, moved around a lot. Um, and I remember, I mean, I remember thinking to myself, because like I love my mom, she's here with me, she's visiting. Um, but I remember seeing her like she's, She's an act of service. She loves to serve. And um, she, my, my biological dad was an abusive, uh, alcoholic person. And, and she lived through that for 13 years. I don't remember much of it. But then she went from that to being married, uh, to being into another relationship where, where it wasn't physical abuse, but it was mental uh, abuse. And I remember thinking just uh, like, that re those relationships, looking at that, like, I never want that for myself. I am never going to put up with a man. Um, and it was very, it was very hard for me to not look at relationships in that sense where I felt like um, I couldn't trust men. I, uh, there were no good examples of what a godly man was in my life for a long time. And so um, when I met him, it was kind of like an eye-opening to see, okay, God, there are people, there are men, there are good men out there who really do have a heart for you and uh, lead by example. It's not just, you know, words. It's actually the actions that they live. And it, but it took me a long time to, to kind of get to that point where it was like, how do I serve him? How do I respect him and honor him the way God wants me to respect him and honor him because I mean a lot of times um, for women especially I feel like even for myself there are times where I feel like uh, he's not making the right choice he needs to do this and we want to control everything and it's and it's kind of like God saying like you need to just step back and let me deal with him right uh, which is hard for me to say because I want to be in control and I want to tell him what to do all the time um, and it's sometimes to the point where, like, he's, he's the head of our home. He is um, that godly lead in our home, and I need to show him that respect. And I want to do that. I want to honor him. Just like, just like how God wants us to honor him and respect him and, and be obedient to him, it's the same way for me in our relationship, in our marriage, um, to kind of follow that example. It's not like I'm going to be a doormat and, and he's going to, abuse that um, power over me because he does it in a loving way like he provides for me and he loves for, he loves me and I know that he shows me a lot of grace just like grace just like I show him grace 
So let's talk about something. The Bible's very clear. God looks at man and says it's not good for him to be alone. And he, he now builds a partner. It says helper in some texts, but a couple weeks ago we unpacked that a little more. It's more than just some person that's next to them going like, how can I help you? Like it's like, no, they are united on the same mission and they bring like two different giftings that make a better like fullness of that. So that's very clear. But then it is very clear about like what the role of, of a man is, which a couple of weeks ago we unpacked that, and, and the woman and, and what that looks like, what a godly man should look like, uh, those kind of things. And, and then scripture speaks about this and says, wives submit. And I was like, I'm not going to unpack that today. I'll let my wife do it. So um, what does that mean when we say that, that kind of word? Because that word comes with a lot of weight for maybe a lot of you. Uh, what is, I'm not submitting. Like, no, we're partners in this. So what does that look like? And then we'll get to the men. Okay, so I'm still, I feel like it's always going to be a work in progress, right? Because um, it's a battle for me um, to sometimes really be obedient to God in, in the sense of how do I submit to him, right? And, and what does that really look like? Um, especially because we live in a DNH where women want to be equal to men. And, um, but that's not how God intended it. Because like Scott said from the very beginning, God, like in Genesis, he talks about God didn't want men to be alone, right? And he created the woman for, to be that companion, that helper, um, to her, to, to, to Adam, but in the same sense, even though, like, I mean, sin entered and everything got, got messed up and, and um, derailed, still God's intentions for us in marriage is to, to kind of still follow that, um, and it's a constant battle, like I said before, where I have to submit myself um, and be filled by the Holy Spirit, like, go to God, especially when I feel like there are times where I feel like we're being spiritually attacked, but there's also times where it's me and it's not just him. And so I have to stop and recognize, like, what am I doing right now? Why do I want to be right? Do I want to be right or do I, do I want to be in a healthy relationship with him where I can um, honor him and respect him um, and, and help and encourage him, right? Um, for us to grow together, but individually, because we do want to be equally yoked. Um, and so a lot of times it's, it's more like listening to God. And the only way I can listen to God and what he calls me to do is to be, to be still, to surrender to him and, and not be fearful. Because where is that really coming from? Where is, it coming, where is that coming from where I'm like, I want to be right or whatever arguments we get into, what, what, it, what is, I, like just getting to the root of it. And oftentimes it doesn't, it's not that big of a deal. It's not real like, big things it's just us getting in the way and when we let god be the center of it all he blesses it a couple things so one girl. you go girl <laughs> get it um hey uh a couple things one uh this is not some idea like we have to make sure because we hear these words and sometimes we take them not where the scripture's taken them so this whole submit even it's not submit in an abusive, unhealthy relationship. That's not what it's speaking about. So, like, don't take it places that the Scripture's not taking it. Um, but then also see this partnership as, like, one, God created men, and I know every man needs a supporter. And what I mean by that is someone that's telling them, hey, what you're doing, you're doing a good job. You're making a difference. You're having an impact. Because, man, we want to seem like we're doing something, and often we hear nothing, and that tears them down. Your husband needs to hear hey, you're doing a good job. Um, but then also we need to see what does God say about the man? And God says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, when we look at that, and if you go through the text, and many of you probably already know what Christ did for us, the church, every single believer, you know this, Christ gave himself completely, surrendered his own, own life. He, he, he would take uh, the sin of the world upon his shoulders. He took that type of weight. That's what a husband is called to do, is to serve his family, to serve his spouse, just like Christ served the church. And when that is happening, then you see the unity of a marriage. You see, man, 
what I see all the time is, it seems like when God says, when these two things function, when both of you are willing to put the other's needs ahead of yourself, that's where you see this healthy relationship. What about me? Well, your spouse is worrying about you as you worry about them. But in this way as well, is man, it is so much easier to come alongside a spouse when they are continuously giving of themselves and serving you. That is a partner that is worthy of it. So, okay, we're running out of time. So there's this. There's a guarding love. How do you guard and protect? Scripture speaks about foxes come to kill and destroy. And this is what Satan does. This is what evil does, wants to destroy, wants the divorce rate to continue to skyrocket and see marriages and relationships broken and kids growing up in different homes and all this stuff. It wants destruction. It wants dysfunction. It wants all this stuff. How do you succeed in this moment of knowing that there is attack after attack. Every time you open your phone, there's temptation. All these different things. And one of it is what you were talking about is one of my greatest weaknesses. I love a good debate. And I don't mean any, like I don't want to hate you over it. I want to I win the argument every time. I will try to win no matter what the argument is. The problem is, am I trying to win an argument or win a marriage? Because that matters. Do I, do I need to win the argument and be right, or do I need us to be united? And that's important for all of us in every type of relationship we had. And trust has to be that foundation. And sometimes the struggle is that trust has been broken and things have happened. But we see throughout scripture also that God seems to reconcile and redeem things that we never thought possible. And is it possible also for trust to be restored? And that is where we can build a healthy relationship. But also understand this, marriage is not just a a covenant. It is a covenant, but it is not just a covenant. It is a a companion. And God says, I'm going to make someone just right. And that's not just so you guys go like, all right, this is a covenant. We're stuck till life, like, till I take my last breath. This is it. Like, that's cold and like kind of dark. Like, I don't, I don't want that type of relationship either. No, God wants someone that actually is going to help you thrive even more. And God wants these relationships to be a blessing. Um, and we see it. We, we can sometimes question and go, God, what were you thinking? God made them male and female. And man, there's a lot of times where that butts heads and, and she is so different from me. And usually every marriage that I see is always one of them is far more thrifty with finances and the other loves to spend every dime they got. One of them uh, stresses about everything and the other seems like they don't worry about a thing. Like all, we're so different about everything. But I think even in that, we see God is doing that to make us better, to make us like whole. Like Jenny would always stress more about finances. And I was one that was like, there's $5 in the bank account. Let's, let's go, McDonald's. Um, like it was not smart. Now, she is helping me grow in that and go like, well, maybe we should think about tomorrow also. And I'm like, but God says he'll take care of us even more than the birds of the air. It's like, no, maybe he didn't mean it that way. Um, but then the other way is, is Jenny has maybe relaxed a little and, and maybe uh, opened up your grip a little more on uh, stressing. Uh, in the same way, uh, I am very much a planner. I plan my whole life. I have my calendar set up where there's this analytics that tells me how I spend my day in different things. So if I'm just in meetings all day long, I go, well, this is way too much. I need to focus on this. Whatever it might be, I love that kind of stuff. My wife doesn't want to look at a calendar if her life depended on it. So she is the kind of girl that if you're like, hey, want to go to the beach in five minutes? She's like, let's go. And I'm like, no, I needed a 48-hour notice at minimum. And honestly, I need a week notice. Um, So now the benefit is she has stretched me a little, a little, where I am a little more willing to be spontaneous, but she is also stretched to be a little more of a planner with me. So there are ways where we make each other better. What? It's taking only 13 years. And we still are horrible (laughs) at it. But God didn't want you to do it in 13 years. He wants you to do it in like 30 or something. All right. Okay, moving on, right? Let's keep on going. Kids. Let's talk about kids for a second. Um, Parenting. Parenting is difficult. Parenting gets harder. I think it was last week. I can't even remember where I shared about parenting. And man, day and age now is so much different than it was before. Where uh, what you and I, when we were growing up, uh, man, there were not the type of temptations, conversations, uh, man, coming from school, coming from society, coming from 
everywhere that our kids are bombarded by. Today, we were never exposed to in the same way. How do we parent in this? How do we deal with this? Um, and it's one, it's important. Parents know this. Uh, God has a, if you will, totem pole of your life and how that should look. God first, then your spouse, then your kids. The moment you had kids did not mean that your spouse falls to the bottom and now you lift your kids up. You need to care about your marriage. Your kids need to see what a healthy marriage looks like, what real companionship looks like, that you prioritize that person, that you love their mother, you love their father, and that you care about them, that you go, hey, we're leaving you because we're going to go on a date night. And they go, that is what relationship looks like. Now also, parents, dads, you need to take your kids on dates. You need to tell your daughters that they are loved and they are perfect the way they are and that no boy needs to tell them that they matter more than their dad tells them. So there are things that we can do. But kids, if you're in the room right now, which I know it's family Sunday or whatever, um, you want a phone and you want these different things. And you're like, but all my friend Timmy has one. And it's like Timmy and his parents are not that smart. You need to understand there are stats about things. Kids with phones, the stats on depression, on anxiety, on suicide, all these things because of what is going into their life. And we sometimes don't even see it. Parents see it. And kids learn. Sometimes your parent is telling you no for a reason that is better than the moment of gratification. The other thing is dating. Nowadays, kids want to date at crazy ages where they're like, I got five boyfriends. It's like, no, you don't. Um, You... You need to also understand your parents, maybe they see a bigger value that dating is for a purpose and that you are trying to find your soulmate maybe and that that comes in time and at the age of 16, you probably ain't gonna find it. So maybe you need to worry about discovering who you are because you're a mess right now and you need to discover that first and who God created you to be and then you can start to discover a spouse. All right, good? Anything? I just went on. You wanna say anything about parenting? I do all the parenting in the home. I'm just joking. <laughs> all right. Nothing? No. Okay. Sorry, guys. We are running out of time. All right. Um, trauma, trust, adultery, porn, all these things that enter our marriages, relationships. Uh, how do we come back from this? Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive one another as Christ forgave you. How do we live a life in relationships where we can forgive even when it hurts so much. And when we stop and we really see, if we could truly understand, God forgives you everything in your life that you've done. And sometimes maybe some of you are like, my life is pretty good. I haven't messed up that much. But if you truly stop and realize this is what God says and this is who God is, and you have chosen yourself over and over again, and you have cheated on God with your own selfish actions, your own selfish choices, you have done all these things, and God still pursues you. And Christ forgives you. And then God says, hey, I want you to forgive others the way that I forgive you. Now, I'm not saying that you remain in an abusive relationship, a bad relationship. Scripture speaks to a lot of those things. Scripture speaks about divorce, and it doesn't just say that divorce is never acceptable. It speaks about times where maybe it will and should happen. And that needs to be understood. Make sure you hear that. And if you need to hear more about that, you can. But you need to understand that also God wants relationships and marriages where both of the people are forgiving each other, just like Christ forgave all of us. Christ sees us as his sons and daughters. He loves us and he wants us to act in the same way with each other. Trust can always be regained. Anything on that? I mean, the only thing I can say is um, it's not an easy thing to gain that trust back. It's going to take work. Um, But God, I mean, you can't you can't disregard God's power and miracle, uh, power of miracle that he can work in your relationship and rebuild that. We've had couples, we've met couples that have gone through the brokenness of um, being cheated on, right? Like adultery in the marriage. And we've seen how God has worked in their marriage and brought them back together. And it's still a work in progress, but it's, there's, there, it's so beautiful to be able to see how God brought that together and he's unifying it. And now they're like stronger than they were before because of that, because they've both given themselves completely to God and trusted that God's going to rebuild their marriage and fix that. You know, it's, um, 
it is possible. It's not impossible. Um, so, I mean, that's the only thing I can add to that is um, it's difficult when you're going through it. I'm not going to say that it's an easy thing. It's not like you can say anything or do anything to tell you that um, to make you feel better in the moment when you're going through it. It's not easy, but it's possible. And, and again, like Scott said, is surrounding, surrounding yourself with people that you know you can trust and help you get through those difficult moments. Um, coming to church and being part of that community, join a community group. Build that community around you that you know that they'll have your back and that they can encourage you through that season. And not point fingers or anything, and it's not like you're gonna say all the horrible things that your spouse put you through, but like that they can encourage you and help you grow in your own personal relationship with God and trust that God's going to rebuild your marriage and bring that back together. All right. Homework. Write this down. Put it in your phone. I don't care. But um, I got two things for you. If you're married, if you're even dating, I think maybe these are good practices. Uh, sit together weekly. Uh, sit down. It can be over a cup of coffee in the morning before work. It can be at the end of your day with a cup of tea, um, if that's your thing. Uh, but ask this question. Uh, just say, tell me something you've never told me. Uh, now, that, that can be crazy. Um, they're like, I killed a person. Um, whoa. Uh, don't tell them that one. Uh, keep that on lock. I'm just sorry. Okay. But it, maybe it's things, hey, you know, this week I've been feeling this way. Uh, I feel like we haven't spent any quality time together. I feel like I haven't gotten to really, like, get to know you. I feel like we've been stagnant. I uh, man, I'm struggling at work, whatever it might be, but tell me something and let a conversation begin. Uh, research shows that if you spend five hours of quality time a week, uh, it will always lead to a healthier relationship and marriage. Uh, start looking at how can we do that. If you were me, you would get a calendar and you would uh, code it. Um, but maybe you need to figure that out. And that's not always easy. And right now you might be going, I got young kids. Like, how are we going to spend five hours a week of quality time? You might have to get creative, and it might be 30 minutes here and there. Um, but I guarantee you this, if it's not five hours, at least get something closer than what it is right now and begin to see God work in your marriage and build it stronger. All right, but here's the final thing, the good life. God doesn't want you to just survive in your marriage emotionally and spiritually. He wants you to thrive, uh, and he has plans for that. And his word speaks to all that, that you can discover a thriving life in these ways. But know this, marriage is not the point of your life. Uh, it's, the most important thing is not to have a good marriage. It's to know the one who created marriage. Everything in your life points to this. No, nothing else matters if you don't know who Christ is. Nothing else matters if you don't know who God is. And God wants you to experience the, the greatest of things, the most important relationship you have. The second marriage is that spouse, that person that you are gonna commit to the rest of your life. The first is always and will always be your relationship with Jesus. Who do you say he is? He changes things. He can restore relationships you never thought possible. He can take you from a mess, from an addict, from a struggle, like from anger, from all these things, and he can do amazing things in your life, but it starts with you going, I recognize Christ as my Lord and Savior. And what that means is, I come under his authority, and I follow his words as my own life, and I will follow what he says, and I will begin to trust him in all areas, and you will begin to discover a thriving life, a thriving marriage, thriving in your parenting, in all these areas, when you stop trusting yourself, and you start trusting God. Heavenly Father, I pray for uh, everyone in this room. I pray for those that are in a season right now of singleness and maybe on their heart is, man, God, where is that one for me? Uh, and God, I pray that you would, uh, you would guide them to that person, but in your timing, not in ours. And God, we would trust you in that. God, I pray for those that are dating. Uh, that are pursuing each other, that, man, they would put up a list of going, these are priorities and essentials in this relationship. But then, God, I pray for marriages. Marriages, man, you, it's a picture of your promise and covenant to us is a covenant that we make with each other. God, I pray that you would bless the marriages in this place. 
I pray that you would guide conversations, that difficult conversations might be had, but for ultimate healing, reconciliation, and for growth. God, I pray for the kids. I pray that we as parents would see our role, our responsibility, that we are influencing and impacting another generation, and we need to build them up in the ways of you and your word. God, I pray for just a blessing on all the different relationships. God, that we would walk away from this conversation and we would see what you are calling us to. God, that we would discover your amazing grace and mercy that shows up in our relationships and our marriage. God, that we would discover your word, it would transform our life, and it would all be through the Holy Spirit that guides and directs. God, we thank you. God, we praise you, we worship you, and it's in the name of Jesus we say, amen. Hey guys, I really hope this message was uh, encouraging to you today. That's right, my wife and I are so honored that you joined us in this way. And we'd love to encourage you. Uh, it, one, if you'd like to connect with us more, uh, if you live locally, and uh, we'd love to have you visit us in person. If you'd like to join us in the mission here and uh, partner with us, uh, we'd love for you to receive all of that and even other messages, and you can find all that at this resource right here. Thank you so much for joining us. 